Uh, Stefan Hines is our next speaker. Uh, he's a, a biomedical engineer who is uh, working in Eindhoven uh, doing his PhD, I think. Uh, and he has been involved in setting up a, a range of open science um, uh, forums, such as the Open Science Community Eindhoven and Open MR Benelux. And his main uh, area of uh, expertise is fMRI. And he's going to talk to us today about uh, data sharing in Europe. And uh, I will pass over to Stefan. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can someone confirm that you can hear me and see my screen? Yeah, we're good. Great, thanks. Uh, so thank you for the introduction. Um, so I'll be talking about um, balancing open data with personal data privacy and a future outlook on MRI, MRI data sharing. Uh, let's see. So this is me. I um, have a background in uh, electrical engineering and working on software tools to improve the quality of real-time functional MRI. And currently I'm working as a research staff, a data and software engineer at the uh, Research Center Jülich in Germany. Um, but based in the Netherlands. Um, and we're specifically working on this data lab tool, which is for decentralized data management and also uh, generating user friendly data browsing catalogs from structured metadata. So that's kind of my focus. And I will be presenting a few items that probably have a bit of a bias towards um, neuroinformatics or, or brain MRI. Um, because that's my, that my, my background. And I'll also be reusing some slides from the previous presentation that's linked there. I don't have any conflicts of interest to declare that I'm aware of. So um, I think in 2021, there's a lot of excitement, but also requirements from, um, from funders and expectations just from the community itself to, to share all of our data. So there's a lot of talk about it. Um, but I think there's a um, perhaps a, uh, a concern also there. So there's valid reasons, of course, um, and I, I'm sure a lot of us are aware of those in the sense that we want to enhance the, the uh, reproducibility of our work. Uh, we should allow people to, to, um, to check the validity of our, our results. Um, if we share our data, we can get people to, to extend the work uh, we can start collaborations. Um, all the results that are open can, can be put together. It can be meta-analyzed. It can be um, improved upon uh, as, we, as we often refer to this kind of incremental process of science. So there's a lot of these valid reasons for sharing data. Also uh, in the sense that a lot of people consider, consider it an ethical, um, um, not statement, um, approach because we are often funded by public uh, money, by taxpayer money. So then it makes sense to, to spread the knowledge, so to say. Um, but obviously there are also concerns when we share data, um, concerns that we should uh, take note of in, the, in this uh, time where it's, there's a lot of excitement and, and requirements around sharing data. And, and most of all, this means taking care of the personal data privacy of, of participants. And especially when we talk about MRI, we often have human participants. And that's obviously very important. Um, but there are also other valid concerns that people have noted. So uh, if you do not want to make an error in public, that's a valid concern. Um, often there are concerns about the fact that the data is just too messy. Um, to, to analyze by someone else. So if we consider these fair principles, it might not be interoperable or reusable at all. So uh, in that sense, um, the, the, it's a valid concern to have uh, when sharing this type of data. And one of the other things that's, that I find really important is that it is, uh, can be a crazy amount of work to actually get data to the point where it's fair and shareable. And it's even more work if you have to do this alone and you don't have support either from within your lab or your group or your institution. So I think when we consider, consider these concerns and, and also this, um, uh, the positive aspects about data sharing, we are often uh, uh, in, the, in the position where we, it feels as if we have to decide between these two. So we have to see transparency and reproducibility on the one side 
and personal data, data privacy on the other hand. Um, and as researchers, we're like, okay, which one should we decide? This is very stressful. And in my opinion, um, this is somewhat of a false dichotomy. And I'll explain a bit more about why I think so. So I, I think we should try and get to the point if in some cases we are not already there, that we can we can uh, find a compromise between privacy, protecting the privacy of, of participants and also being transparent in terms of sharing fair data. So I wanna start by saying how we can get there uh, and how we can get there is looking at the things that have made data sharing easier uh, up until now. And there's quite a number of um, examples that we gathered from different people working in the field. Um, and uh, one of which, one of the strongest uh, aspects being the main standards. And as the previous speaker also mentioned, something like DICOM, NFT, all of these uh, fair principles that make it clearer how to approach data sharing, but also how to structure your data such that it can be interoperable, for example. Um, and in, in, at least in brain imaging, we have uh, DICOM, Nifty, and BID standards, which are all quite um, uh, ubiquitous already. Um, then we have uh, things that have driven these domain standards. And uh, I think uh, we should to take note of that as well. So a large consortia who have worked together to, to get more data into a study, for example, but more representative data. And then you have to, if it's cross-site uh, collaborations, you have to start thinking about how do you make these data work together? Um, also things that on an infrastructure level have contributed to this is the fact that you can uh, get cheaper uh, storage and a more widely accessible storage uh, to put the data itself. Um, and then cloud infrastructure that have been built on top of that. So in a very useful example in the Nero imaging space is Open Nero, um, where you can share all of your nifty based data that's structured according to this BIDS um, data structure. And I have examples that I've linked to here as well. Obviously, of course, XNet Central, which has been quite a while in development and, and use. And then once people start recognizing that these standards exist and that they are quite accessible when it comes to places where you can put those data and ways in which you can use those data, there's also uh, been a lot of technological, technological adaptation to these standards. So if you have a standard structure that you can expect um, that, that people adhere to, you can build apps on top of that. So you can build automated pipelines that understand those structures and make it just more crowdsourceable the way that people start to analyze um, data, especially large data sets. And examples of that, again, from the near imaging perspective would be BEDS apps. But also we have along this way where we've come to uh, recognize that data sharing gets easier and easier, also encountered a lot of challenges. Um, so a lot of them being related to data, to privacy and systemic uh, challenges. With data itself, obviously, if we work with MRI data sets and human uh, data sets, um, it can become quite large. So we have to think about these storage demands. And then um, we have to also think about how these large data sets are becoming um, interoperable. So how, how do we build tools that make us that then enable us to speak to data that uh, might live in different um, places, um, uh, although we want those places or at least those data from those different places to be pulled together for a certain type of analysis. When we think about privacy, um, there's much more, um, I would say, uh, aspects with regards to the law, the regulations, et cetera, that's important. So in Europe, we have the GDPR, which is quite um, extensive compared to many other privacy laws, but it's also quite ambiguous when it comes to research data. And there's been some updates that allow us to understand that more, but, but even so, you will find very often that data privacy officers from different institutions, even within the same country or region, um, have different views on which data can, for example, be considered anonymous and which ones are not sufficiently anonymized yet. 
so these things are quite uh, quite often seen and it's still quite a challenge to get past these to say for example if you are staying uh, if you're operating from the netherlands or you're operating for germany for those people to decide that you can sh share your data in a specific uh, repository um, is not as easy as that um, they might have different views on, on these things so that's a, a very big challenge i think um, and also uh, there's an absence of regulatory checks um, to discourage people from uh, using the data in any sort of nefarious way um, so we have this uh, scenario where we want to share data and we want to be sure that it's uh, put to good use but uh, there's no actual discouragement of using it uh, for reasons of for in ways that might be against commonly accepted ethical um, standards um, so so it's kind of this scenario where we put data out there and we just hope that everyone uses it for a good use and that's obviously not um uh, that's quite ambiguous um and then systemic issues is we we do not have widely um implemented uh research data management related skills and expertise in in all of our institutions um so we speak about all of these tools interoperable tools and how they can be put to good use but by whom um and and that's a big challenge still that we need to get more expertise with related uh, with regards to data management into labs into institutions so these people can also help um, adopt these new standards and, and contribute to them as, as well so how do we balance this um, and i want to uh, focus basically on getting secured personal data and fair data into the same space um, by looking at decentralized resource data management practices and tools and i think that's something that that's been contributed a lot but that requires a lot more um, uh, adoption in, in, in our field. Um, and what do they mean? I'm just going to run through all of these things quickly. So what I mean with the centralized tools uh, for research data management, firstly, I want to focus on open source because these uh, tools that are open source allow um, increased accessibility across our domains, across uh, geographical uh, boundaries, um, and also there's a lot, uh, a very quick um, development when it comes to interoperability of standards in open source. And there are some examples here, um, like accessible data hosting, which Gen is an infrastructure for near imaging data in Germany, very much like uh, GitHub, but that, can, that you can actually for free host uh, quite large amounts of data. The main standards that we know, but and cloud services that build on top of those domain centers like brain life. Um, something other that we should also focus on in this uh, uh, kind of range for decentralized resource data management is user friendliness, uh, because a lot of the times it's still quite seen as a as a only the domain of technical uh, people. So um, if you know how to work with the command line, then you're fine. If you don't know, then you're then you cannot use these tools. At least that's that could be a perspective, and that's something that we should work against, especially since we want these things to be more interoperable and usable by by more researchers. So we we should work on user friendliness to to lower barriers for individual researchers. And then finally, something that's really important in this space, I think, is what do we do with data that that are not allowed to leave the host infrastructure. Um, and, and in that sense, we need to focus on um, different uh, ways, different interoperable tools to make that possible. And I have a just a few examples. So usually we, um, we what we do is we uh, want to get data to our workstation. So in the example of Open Nero, you can just download big functional MRI data sets um, to your uh, wherever you are located and that's seen as data to user but in our sense when we do not want necessarily everyone to be have access to the data but we we still want people to come in and uh, um, process that it could be a case of user to data so that that would be the sense of how it's often done uh, we have a computational cluster with our data somewhere we give a controlled access 
to individuals that have signed something like a data user agreement or that are part of the consortium. And through uh, methods like uh, SSH, they can get access to this uh, data and they can process it on that site. So they, it may not leave it, it may not leave the site and there might be infrastructure for that in place. Then there's new things like code to data where you don't even want people to have direct access to those systems, but you want them to be able to, to analyze it. And the way in which you need to do that is then ask people to send their containerized um, uh, pipelines to your uh, workstation or to your infrastructure where other experts can implement it. So these could all be users. They might work from a example data set um, and they build their, in, their, their pipelines, they containerize it and they send it in some accepted way to server infrastructure where the, the analyses are run and when where the results are then sent back to the users. And then an extension of, of this uh, uh, go to data is feder federated go to data where you don't only have one place where data is hosted, but multiple places. And for this, you then need uh, decentralized data management services where you can collate results and aggregate results from multiple locations. So you send uh, a pipeline, containerized pipeline to somewhere in the US, but you same, send the same pipeline to somewhere in Russia. And then later, the person who sent all the code can aggregate results back to their place. And the, doing that without conflicts is something that we need interoperable tools for. I have a few examples, but I think I'm running out of time. So I'm going to leave this here. And um, the, the, links, the link is there, but you can click on all of these things. Um, so it's not only in theory that these different systems work, but also in practice, there's quite a number of examples of tools that allow this. Um, Datalad being only one of them where I'm involved. And then finally, uh, this is just a summary of my talk to say, where do we go from this point onwards? Um, and I think a very important part here is that the bottom is cultural shifts and training. So yes, we can focus on all the interoperable tools and scalability and uh, working on the domain standards, uh, et cetera. But I think the most important thing that we need to work on um, is getting more expertise uh, for data management um, to, to support researchers, to train researchers, um, not only on data management on the technical level, but also with regards to ethics um, and, and, and data privacy. Um, and before we get uh, anywhere else, I think that should be quite a focus and, and it's, it's not a big focus um, uh, at this point in time, I think, and that should shift. Um, and then from that, uh, I think we can continue developing standards. We need to work on interoperability of these tools that help us aggregate data from multiple sources uh, and build more technology that's, that's more privacy aware and then eventually hopefully scale that so that more research labs across the world can have access to the same tools. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Stefan. That was really, really good. Um, I think, oh, I was just gonna ask a question, but I think one's just come in actually. So um, who do you think should fund data sharing infrastructure, institutions, national agencies, journals, and if there is a mix of resources, how will people know which to choose? And actually, that was my question. So <laughs> one, of those, one of the questions I wanted to ask you. Uh, so, uh, Stefan. Um, well, I think should should fund it. I think national agencies are in a good space to do that. Although, um, obviously, they need to be informed to the level that's representative of, of, of the different institutions in, in the country, for example. I think that's a good place to start. Um, often you see uh, there's there's early adopters for for things like data sharing, but then when it gets to be more uh, accepted, etc., is when, for example, uh, funders uh, tr start to require it. And if there's a, a central kind of top-down uh, um, acceptance of 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 that approach, where um, they are funding national funders and national agencies are funding these efforts um, then it can uh, be more powerful to, to drive adoption across different institutions uh, 
Um, and if there's a mix of resources, how will people know which to choose? I think that there is where we need more uh, skills and expertise in institutions and in, in um, labs themselves. So in the Netherlands, we have uh, quite a number of universities uh, starting to employ data stewards and data managers and, and research engineers, not only um, at, at the university level, but also in, in, in departments or even in labs themselves. And obviously this needs funding. And I think that funding should be recognized as something that's necessary across the board for research. Uh, which, I, I, in my opinion, lies um, in the, uh, the domain of, of national funding uh, uh, units.